currencies that merged the Bach and the Deer. The idea kind of stuck to me when I was in Tanzania, Morogoro National Park in East Africa. So I happened to see a pack of lions feeding on a carcass of a deer. And just about 50 to 100 meters away from the pack of lions was a herd of deer. But none of the lions even dared to or even showed intent in hunting down any of the deer. I've kind of wondered why and kind of answered myself that there is a natural balance in nature between producers and consumers. So for every single week that the pride of lion must live, at least one deer must die. But if it so happens that the lions hunt out all the deer in the forest, in the subsequent week, there will be no replenishment, no reproduction, and thereby there will be no resources for the lion to feed on. What happens then? Both the species, the lions and the deer, both perish. Now, if we have to hypothesize that the lions were to invent or discover the concept of currency and probably deployed or simulated uh, banks in them, what would happen? The lions would hunt and deposit the deer in the bank and earn tokens in return. We'll probably call the tokens as a buck. And these bucks could be deposited in a grocery store or a department store later, where the lions could exchange for the deer meat. Now, what would happen in the process? The stronger lions would hunt more deer. The weaker lions would hunt lesser deer. But both of them will be instigated that the more number of bucks they save, the more secure is the future. And so all the deer in the forest would be hunted, deposited in the bank. The bank would have all the bucks in the world. The lions would have bucks in the pocket. The department store would have bucks with them. But all the deer in the forest would die. And ultimately, all of them die. Now, if we have to juxtapose this onto humanity, where do we stand? We are at a critical juncture wherein about $300 trillion is in global debt, which is roughly about 350% of our global GDP. So what does that stand in terms of magnitude? We need about $1 to $2 trillion every year to make sustainable energy transition or take up any green initiatives. But the level of investments that we're making is way lesser. Why? because capital investments into green initiatives are seem to be untenable or unprofitable because they have longer payback time. So therein you have the societal need of a generation which needs capital for wealth creation towards sustainable living and thereby you have money which is a product of social construct which is not serving this need. And that by is a difference between the buck and the deer. So if we were to uh, So, uh, so if we were to just step back and talk about what, how the wealth creation process works, we need to clearly understand how the fractional banking system of the world behaves. So supposing a person walks into a bank and borrows $100 and uh, say the interest rate is 5%, the person has to pay back $105. The bank then collects this $105, gives it to person B, who again pays back the bank $110, $111 based on the interest, and then this process keeps on moving. And there comes a point wherein some person X, Y, or Z is not able to pay back the loan, and he says, hey, I can't pay back the loan. And therein, you have a mini economic collapse. So both these examples probably seem rudimentary, but it's driving home a valuable point about how unstable our economies are becoming. So I plotted out a graph looking at various data streams. And if you see, in this century, just having crossed 20% of the century, we have already seen 26 economic crises. Compared to the 28 crises in the previous century, which saw two world wars, one cold war, and an oil crisis also. So what makes it so unstable? If you have to look at the trends, the three key trends that we need to look into from this graph. First, the carbon footprint or the, uh, uh, the CO2 emission per capita is always increasing across the century. Second, if you have to uh, look into it, the scale of debt fund or the scale of funding for sustainable energy transition is not keeping up with the pace that it should be. And third is about the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient is a measure of the economic inequality. So if you look at it, the Gini coefficient actually decreases only in a point of time in history where the global wealth deteriorates. At every other point of time when global wealth is generated, the Gini coefficient actually increases, which means economic inequality increases. So that brings to a point, a sentence which I read on the ferry that was flying between uh, Victoria uh, Wharf uh, in Cape Town 
Reuben Island, where Nelson Mandela was prisoned for more than two decades. It read, poverty is a byproduct of wealth creation. It got me thinking. And that's how this entire research started working. So if we were to demonize the whole concept of fiat currency or the fractional banking system, what is the alternative we have? The alternative that we have today are cryptocurrencies. So if we were to say that cryptocurrencies are good, bad, we need to have a judgment based on facts. So what is the intrinsic value of the cryptocurrency or the Bitcoin that we're talking about? So Bitcoin, yes, is driven by blockchain, but most of the cryptocurrency these days is blockchain because uh, is Bitcoin because over 40 percent is capitalized by uh, Bitcoin and another 17 percent by Ethereum. So the complexity of the algorithm is what determines the value. The more number of Bitcoins get into the market, the more complex the future algorithms get, which means the more computational ability is required, which means more energy is consumed. So in the process, are you actually creating a sustainable solution? We need to think about it. And societal impact of the cryptocurrency. There are research works which have shown that more than 40% of the Bitcoin transactions are meant for illicit purposes like black market, black money, swindling, uh, drug purchase, and weapons purchase. So are we creating a sustainable society using cryptocurrency? So if not cryptocurrency, that's Bitcoins, or if not trade currencies, what ultimately is a solution? So that takes us a little back into history. So uh, the concept of currency or the concept of uh, the concept of currency is not something new to humanity. So historically, we have used coffee, tea, tobacco, salt, barley, uh, whatnot. We have used seashells, and sometimes in history, we have even used beer as a currency. So, are we going back to the barter system? Certainly, no. Thanks to science, in the last 100 odd years, we have probably postulated that. Energy can neither be created nor can it be destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. And so does mass. Mass, that's the law of conservation of mass. Now, both of these interoperably oscillated. You could see that everything around us is a summation of mass and energy. And this is not something which is coming from me. In the year 2013, there were a group of economists gathering in split Croatia who actually postulated how energy as a currency could work and what are the key yards that we need to take care of. So, if you have to look at everything around us, the food we eat is in calories, the electricity we consume is in kilowatt hour, the heat content of steam is in kilojoules, uh, the petrol or diesel that we consume coming here has a calorific value in its liters. So everything around uh, us is in terms of energy and mass. So the scientists in 2013 uh, kind of postulated that by using energy as a currency, we could actually bring down inflation because no more would wealth creation be centralized. It would become decentralized. That it would become every, every man's or every, every woman's responsibility. Energy could be saved and has actually been proven empirically through research in Bahrain, the Mazdar case study that, that I'm talking about. And because of this uh, gross uh, so, uh, social inequality or economic inequality could come down. The uh, legalized cost of electricity could come down. The climate financing could become better. But if all of these were advantages, how does it work? How, does it, how do scientists postulate? It's something that we need to think about. So we live in a world which are divided into two. One is the world living without access to electricity. Even as we speak, there are about a billion people living without access to electricity or energy. And there are about another two billion people living with unreliable electricity. And then there is also this world wherein people are talking about energy efficiency, about setting renewable energy targets. That segment is talking about energy efficiency. So there is these two worlds wherein we talk about energy efficiency and the other world that's talking about energy access. So most of the countries that have gone for grid extension programs have seen a 20% dip in the profitability of the distribution companies. Why? Because once people are newly electrified, they actually kind of do not know what to do with electricity. They're not able to convert or, pro or productively convert electricity into revenue stream. So when you start using this energy tokens, which could be traded on a common platform interchangeably for the fake currencies like dollar, euro, Indian rupee, whatever, or for the petrodollar, or for food items, this could actually ensure an alternate revenue stream for these villages or these people who get newly electrified. And thereby, we are securing the process of having cheaper access to finance and economic feasibility of electrifying these villages. So if it is a win-win situation for everybody, why aren't people adopting it? Well, there are about 
half a dozen or probably a dozen startups that are working in this space. And when you talk to them, you realize that the biggest roadblock is about the fear of two different varied um, cryptocurrency and uh, fiat currency not having solved the problem. So if you have to scientifically move forward, we need more research. We need more people talking about it. We need more people realizing that the real elephant in the room is about not having a currency system that relates to the buck and the deer. We have the buck and the deer moving far away from each other right now. And that is probably one of the major reasons why we're becoming more and more unstable. So if you have to move to a sustainable world, if you have to talk about currencies that unite the buck and the deer, it's an idea worth spreading, it's an idea worth debating. And probably if uh, six billion minds get on uh, the world, probably would have a much better solution than a handful of researchers working on energy as a currency. So that's my idea worth spreading, which I thought I should be talking about today in this evening. Thanks for your time. This is Dominic signing off.